Welcome to the NBA Roadshow, episode number 243. My name is John Morgan. Cole Coffee is not with me. He is back home in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, enjoying a uh, wonderful November afternoon and evening, I must imagine. Me, I am at Joint Base Langley Eustis in uh, Virginia. It's either Hampton, Virginia or Newport News, Virginia, based on, I think, who you talk to or what Google result you get, but... A really, really cool facility, man. It's a, it's an Air Force base and an Army base, uh, hence the joint base terminology there. So, I mean, a lot of forces here that we got a chance to go out and uh, take a look at today. But I am out here because I am calling Cage Fury Fighting Championships 80. It is on Friday night on UFC Fight Pass. So, if you're listening to this on Friday, like most people probably do, uh, tune into UFC Fight Pass. Or, hey, even if it's not Friday, watch the replay. If you don't catch it live, watch the replay. Very, very uh, cool setup out here. It's a fight for the troops event. And I uh, had a chance to tour the facility a little bit today, and it's uh, very reminiscent of some of the, the old USC shows. It's been a while since the USC has done a fight for the troops, but very, very reminiscent of that where it's it's set out on a on a hangar uh, out on the, on the airfield. And uh, there's a bunch of helicopters and um, different vehicles. It seems like the, 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 as far as what the Air Force focus on, here is, or, or the Army focus, I guess, as well, um, is, is in terms of um, air support, is really in the helicopters. So it's pretty cool, man. We got to see some of the Apaches and the Blackhawks and, and all that stuff. I'm not a big, you know, military equipment aficionado, so I don't uh, necessarily know all the terms. But man, they were uh, they were walking us through the facilities today, and it's uh, it's it's a pretty impressive sight, man. And obviously, multiple millions and and even billions of dollars invested in the defense of this country. And, man, just all these, you know, cool men and women out there uh, training and, and supporting and, and, and doing. And we got to talk to them a bunch today. Um, it was cool. It was really cool stuff. But I'm here, obviously, for the uh, for the MMA, the mixed martial arts, uh, vacant light heavyweight title on the line in the main event. Uh, big, uh, big show veteran Mike Biggie Rhodes is on there against kind of a local kid out of Maryland named uh, Najim Wali. His nickname is the Afghan Rock, man. This dude is a uh, he's a big 205er. So we'll talk a little bit about that card uh, in a little bit. But uh, yeah, listen, if you if you, you may have heard of joint based Langley uses before, if you're a, if you're a hardcore aficionado of the MMA Junkie brand and MMA Junkie Radio, this is where Gorgeous George and Goes have come out uh, a handful of times, man. They come out here and do military trips, and and they come out with different people and um, you know different different MMA uh, luminaries. I know. There were some stories about Randy Couture being out here, Derek Lewis, uh, Paul Felder. Uh, I think Felice Herrig has done some tour. I mean, they just they've brought a number of names out here and kind of done some, you know, some uh, little events with the troops and kind of come out and sign autographs and take pictures. And I think they've watched some UFC pay per views and, and stuff out here. And they've done all the tours, all the stuff that I got to do today. They've gotten to do that before. So if, if the if the name of the base sounds familiar. Thank the MMA Junkie Radio guys for that, and I could say, man, they, they they got a lot of props out here from the staff and and everything that was uh, the very complimentary of all the work that they've done all the years uh, over the years, I should say. So, was hoping that they would be here with me. It was just uh, unfortunately the the scheduling and stuff just just couldn't get done in time. But I thought they were actually going to be out here with me. So uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> It's been an interesting trip, you know. If if you listened last week, we we had some uh, b- uh, some hopes, some ideas, some thoughts of what might happen. But you ever have one of those days? Y- y- you ever just have one of those days, or one of those weeks, or one of those trips? It's been a little bit like that, man. This this is funny. I uh, you know, I I I, I love getting on here, man. I, I I love having the opportunity to host the MMA Roadshow. and I love getting a chance to talk some MMA. But I gotta imagine that just hearing my voice probably gets a little bit annoying to people. I, I, I mean, hopefully I'm interesting enough that that's not the case, but I got to think you'd want a little variety, a little bit of difference of opinion, maybe maybe some back and forth debate, and you can decide who's right and who's wrong. I would imagine you want that. And so I was first hoping that uh, Gorgeous George and Goes could sit down with me and, and we could be here this week and, and do a, kind of a, a um, you know, a little round table, except, except this time instead of me being a guest on MMA Junkie Radio. They could be a guest on the MMA Roadshow, so we could have a, a meeting of the minds that way, except I would be the one in charge. Unfortunately, they weren't able to make the trip out. Just The, the scheduling just didn't get done in time. There were a lot of kind of uh, balls in the air, so to speak, you know, that were being juggled. So 
didn't get to make that happen. But I will say I'll take this opportunity to plug the spinning back click on MMA Junkie. Uh, it's been fun. The last the last couple of Mondays, we just kind of launched this new uh, video feature, and, and we're getting together every Monday, myself, Gorgeous George, and Goes, and, and we're sitting down in, in this feature called the Spinning Back Click, and we're talking about you know big MMA topics. Five MMA topics is kind of what we're doing right now, but kind of rapid fire. You know, t- two minutes a topic. You know, three minutes at most if it's kind of the main topic. Two minutes on some smaller topic, or even even one minute on some kind of express topics. Um, but it's fun, man. We get, we get both of their opinions, and I kind of get to weigh in as well. And, and we're doing it on video. And we're talking about maybe releasing it on audio as well. But anyway, spinning back click, check that out. I'm in, on MMA Junkie. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be doing that next week as well. Um, so anyway, hope those guys will be here. They weren't. So it is what it is. It happens. All right. So next thing I think, well, no worries. No worries. You know what? We could have some fun with uh, my broadcast partners, CM Punk and Jessica Penne. All right, love love hanging out with those guys. Love working with them, um, but <laughs> that was my plan. Maybe we could all get together. Maybe we do a little round table. Maybe we, maybe the three of us could talk about some MMA topics. In fact, uh, heck, even CM Punk kind of kind of making some news. I guess if um, I, I'm not a big wrestling fan, I'm not. What well, I don't even say big wrestling fan. I'm, I don't follow wrestling at all. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, CM Punk. Uh, because of his connection to the UFC and because of his connection to to me in CFFC, definitely follow his career a little bit. He's getting back involved in wrestling. Uh, he's working for Fox. He's made that clear. Working for Fox, not WWE, and uh, starting to get back involved in the wrestling world again and, and doing a, uh, a kind of a magazine type show, a studio show, if you will, talking about wrestling. Now I thought it was a weekly show. Turns out um, it's not every week, so I don't know. I, I'm sure that's been reported. I doubt I'm, I'm breaking news here, or whatever. But I asked him when he got here. I said, "Oh, man, so you're doing this new weekly show? You're getting back into it?" He's like, "Oh, hell no." He's like, "I don't think I could do weekly, man." <laughs> He's like, "Once or twice a month, something like that. I'll come in and and, and we'll do the show." So. Uh, he's back involved in wrestling again, but I, I, I say all that to say that you know he got held a little bit, um, a little bit late. So he arrived into town later than he thought he was going to be because, uh, on top of his wrestling commitment, they added some uh, some video appearances on uh, on the Colin Cowherd show, I believe, on ESPN. So he had to stay back in L.A. an extra day, and he took the red eye uh, in late last night. Got in this morning. Uh, like I said, we always sit down on Thursdays to record this, and it was a uh, a long night for him. So long night for him. So he's been he's been tired, but but he, he's good sport. Caught some naps, and then we got up and we went and, we went and did the weigh-ins and uh, the fighter meetings. I mean, CM Punk, man, he he gets in there uh, and and kind of takes charge of the fighter meetings. If I'm being honest, um, you know, myself, Jessica Penne, and and him sit there. And really, I kind of let the two of them do most of the work, and and they they do a great job of kind of you know asking the fighters. What's going on? What they're thinking? You know, background, game plan, all that good stuff. So, um, you know, just like the big UFC shows, we get in there and do the fighter meetings, and, and he really kind of ran those. But the thing is, so we're doing the show on the base this week, and it's like I said, the setup is going to be cool. I hope you guys will tune in and watch this show on UFC Fight Pass. I think there's some good fights, but if nothing else, just check out the scenery, man. I think it's going to be a, a really cool scene. In fact, there's a a Chinook helicopter, which again, I'm, I'm, I don't know the terminology a whole lot, but I'm learning about it. A Chinook helicopter, which is kind of that, uh, if you think about it, it's like a dual rotor helicopter. So I'm sure you've probably seen those before that the military uses. Um, I think for more like troop trans, it's, it's more of a, a transport type helicopter than it is an attack helicopter. That'd be like the, the, the Apache helicopter, which which we saw today, which was uh, insane, man. The, the, the amount of technology and stuff that goes on there and, and, and just what goes into it and what those things are capable of. It's crazy. Um, but the Chinook helicopter, kind of more of a, a, a troop transport, cargo transport type uh, helicopter, um, will actually be used in the opening. So the fighters are going to walk kind of through this Chinook helicopter into the fighter walk. So I think it's going to be a cool visual, man. And um, The public is allowed uh, on, onto this event, but it's going to be a lot of uniformed troops as well. So I really do think it's going to be a cool, cool scene. So I'm, so I'm, so I'm super excited about it. But I, I set all that up to say that uh, getting ready for this event, getting everything set up, it's a lot of work for the people behind the scenes. And, and CFFC has a a dedicated crew. But as as any regional promotion is, it's it's not a crew that's you know 
heavy on staff. I mean, they've got to kind of run as lean as possible to be profitable at this level. So, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're doing a million things and, you know, this is not a casino. This is not a situation where there's a bunch of infrastructure already in place that you're just kind of plugging and, and, and playing. That's, uh, in fact, quite the opposite. I mean, everything that's being done has to be brought onto the base and set up and, and it's tough, man. It makes, it just makes for more work. And, and I mean, they're, they're pros, they're getting it done. So that's not going to be an issue. It's just, there's a lot more steps than there is for like, when, when, for instance, when we do a show in Atlantic city or we do a show in Philadelphia, you know, some of these casino partners, that's easy. You know, they've got the venues there. The lighting just comes in you set that up rig, you know, no, not, not the case here. So anyway, uh, it's just everything ran long. Meetings ran a little bit long. Everything, every just thing takes long because it takes longer to get everything done. So the schedule kind of went to hell, and uh, unfortunately, no Jessica Penne and no CM Punk <laughs> was not able to pull them aside. It just got late, to be honest. It's 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 way later than I, than I wanted to sit down to record. But hey, man, 243 consecutive weeks. We have not missed a single week, and that sure as hell is not about to start now. So. That didn't happen. So plan A didn't happen exactly the way I wanted. Plan B didn't happen exactly the way I wanted. But then I said, you know what? You know who I can reach out to. I I know who I can reach out to for some extra insight. My man Simon Head, he's over there in uh, England. Of course, him and Abby Subban are working together um, to cover Bellator Europe 6 MVP versus Melillo. Yes, not I know, kind of a new name there. Michael Venom Page facing a newcomer. Now we've got to let Bellator off the hook a little bit. That wasn't their plan going in, but it's it's what ended up happening. They lost a headliner, so they brought in Giovanni Melillo, who uh, actually, to be reminded by Dan Tom, I, I forgot about that, was actually on the Venator FC card several years ago uh, that myself and Michael Chiesa called uh, over there in Milan, Italy. So uh, I had to kind of pull back the, 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 the pull up the records and pull back the tape and go, oh yeah, now I remember who this guy is. I thought it was somebody I'd never heard of before, but I do remember. So um so anyway, I turned to Simon Head and I said, listen, Simon, need a need a need a big favor from me, bro, if you don't mind. Do, do you mind just doing a, you know, maybe a ten to fifteen minute segment, kinda fill us in on what's going over there. I'm sure maybe if you're a hardcore fan, you might have seen the the uh the news a little bit, man. I mean there was some some madness over there. Uh <laughs> and and not even from, from people that are that are fighting, uh, but your man your, your man James Gallagher uh, and Mike Kimball got into things over over at uh, a media day in London ahead of the event. Now again, um, th- they're not <laughs> they're not fighting each other at the event, but that didn't stop things from happening. They definitely made some headlines. So um, I thought I'd get his insight over there and then just maybe a preview of the card and Simon Head. Being the all pro that he is, he said, bro, I got you done. Don't even worry about it. It was late at night. He's had a long day. He's got weigh-ins in the morning. But he's like, man, you know I'm a fan of the road show. I got you. And he did. And he he sat down and recorded everything. And then he uploaded it. And uh, I downloaded it. And somewhere between him and me, things didn't go right because there's about 14 minutes of silent audio. (laughs) <laughs> so I don't know what happened, but the the problem is, unfortunately, Simon Head's asleep right now, as he should be, because he's got to get up early for these uh, the weigh-ins in the morning. And of course, uh, the cold coffee is back home in Vegas, waiting on the audio. So, Plan A with the Junkie Radio crew fell through. Plan B with CM Punk and Jessica Penne f- fell through. Plan C with uh, Simon Head fell through. So it's it's one of those days, man. It's one of those days, but the show must go on. <laughs> and I'll say this, it's not a bad place for the show to go on. So we, we're staying on the base. We're staying at a place called the General Smalls Inn. It's like a little hotel. Um, it's, I mean, it's just a normal hotel, but, you know, like anywhere on the road. I mean, nothing fancy, but just a typical hotel. And, of course, with it being General Smalls, everybody is making plenty of Biggie Smalls references. Um, but I will say this, and I, I was warned, or, or maybe not warned, but advised by the Junkie Radio crew and uh, Dan Tom as well, who has made the trip out here, that they have the cheapest alcohol you'll ever find. And they were not lying. 
uh, the you at the at the front desk. Now they don't have a bar, unfortunately, so that's a little weird. Um, but they have a lobby where you can kind of hang out and get a couple cocktails. And the front desk has uh, frosty beverages for a dollar twenty. That is all included, and of course, there's no there's no tax on that. And of course, there's no tip because you're just buying it from a basically the same person that checks you into your hotel room for one dollar and twenty cents per bottle. And then they also have room service. Uh, you know, like the room, like the, well, I say, room service, like the room service bottles are what you would get on an on an airline. Um, they got bottles of alcohol there, so I got a, uh, the the Crown Royal here for uh, for three dollars uh, a bottle. So. You know, just a little small one, but it's like three dollars a shot, right? So I, I, you know, I I was having a couple cocktails downstairs with everybody. We were wrapping up our meetings, and once we got our meetings wrapped up, I said I gotta go record the road show. And I said, let me get a couple frosty beverages. Well, a couple. I said, let me get six frosty beverages, and let me get three of these Crown Royals as well to go. So six Budweisers, three Crown Royals, and it came to a grand total of sixteen dollars. God bless. God bless. Can't beat it. <laughs> uh, so looking forward to the card. I, I hope you tune in. I do want to talk about it briefly in just a second. But first, I, I did want to go over the UFC real quick. Now, this is a rare weekend without a UFC. Now, rare for most weekends. Get used to it. Man, uh, you know, we're going to we're gonna have some weeks coming up. And, and, and no complaints, man. Uh, December 14th is UFC 245 in Las Vegas. That's going to be a phenomenal card. The next week, December 21st, is uh, the UFC over in Busan, South Korea. There is no end-of-year show this year. Okay, There is no Christmas week show. There is no New Year's Eve you know, week show. Um, in fact, January 18th is the first show of the new year for the UFC. So we're talking about a good you know, four-week stretch where there's not going to be any UFC events. It's good. It's good, man. You know, One of the things about covering the sport is we just don't get a break from it. right? I mean, we talk about oversaturation all the time. And and I think part of the reason is is not, you know, nobody ever talks about oversaturation in baseball where you play 162 games a year, but the thing is you get three you know three four months away from it right you you get time some absence to make the heart grow fonder, and so when when I hear people talk about you know UFC oversaturation or MMA oversaturation I get it I understand where they're coming from. You know me if you listen to the show. I don't believe in that. I, I think it's great, man. The more opportunities, the better. The more chances there are for these people to make a living, the better. The more chances they have to fight, the more opportunities, the better. But what happens is there's not enough time away to kind of miss the sport a little bit, to miss the events because it's all year long. You know, a lot of the, the – um, some well, I say a lot, but several of the PR team that works for the UFC came from baseball or they've done baseball at one point or another. And – you know, I talked to them about the, that's what I'm like, dude, that's got to be a grind, man, 162 games. And think about that, 162 games, and if you cover baseball as a journalist, there's a there's a pre-fight, all right, pre-fight, there you go, just <laughs> dialed into me. But there's a, a pre-game availability with, with the manager, and then there's a post-game availability with the manager and players as well. So every single day you're talking about pre-game, the game, post-game, 162 games. I was like, dude, that's got to be a grind, man. That's got to be the worst. They said, yeah, man, it's it's tough. But then we also get three or four months away. And that's what we don't get in MMA. And I think that's why the, the, the discussion of oversaturation, the discussion of too much MMA gets brought up so often. There's just not a chance to be away from it and miss it. And so I think the end of this year is going to be good. I think everybody's going to get kind of a nice, clean break. I mean, you're still going to have some events, don't get me wrong, which is cool. You know, Bellator is going to be over in Hawaii that same week. Uh, as Busan, South Korea, and then of course Bellator is going to Japan, and they're doing the double up uh, with, with Ryzen over there, which I think is is awesome, man. I'm so I'm, I'm so excited to see that as well, man. Some so, you know get to see a little uh, you know blend of the two events. So I'm excited about that. But you're not going to have the big UFC events. You're going to have a little break. And 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 by the way, I mean um, it's it's ESPN that generated a lot of this. ESPN they just have so much content with college football and all that end of year stuff. They just didn't need content. So that's that's my understanding, kind of the, the, the way things fell, the way they did, and why the USC's not doing these shows. Uh, but but I think it's a good thing. So anyway, this past weekend, USC on ESPN Plus 22, Blahovich versus Jacare. Um, it's taken a lot of grief, and rightfully so. This was not a phenomenal event. Um, I think it's probably taken a little bit more grief than it should. But, man, just the way the thing ended, 
it, it just, man, it made it rough. I mean, Jan Blachowicz and, and, and Jacare Souza, split decision. Um, I I had it scored for Jacare, but I have no problem with this. I gave Jacare rounds one, two, and three. But to me, honestly, I, I just don't understand how you could call this a robbery or, I mean, the, man, I mean, you're talking about so little between the two fighters that we were, you know, that we were judging on, you know, that, that we were giving points on. So, I mean, I have, you know, when they read the decision, it went the other way. I, I'll be honest, I just, I didn't even bat an eye. I mean, I feel bad for Jacques Array. I mean, Jacques Array has been at the top of the game for so long and, you know, just never seemed to quite break through and, you know, it was it was one reason or another along the way that, that the UFC title shot never came. And I don't know. You know, at 205, oh, man, I, I don't know. You know, we talked about it, you know, mentioning Dan Tom earlier. You know, we talked about it going into that fight where, you know, he had said, you know, a theory that uh, some others had come up with but that he had seen and that he had kind of subscribed to is that, you know, when fighters move up in weight – and their style is based on grappling. They t- they tend to struggle a little bit more than a fighter moving up in weight, whose style relies on striking. And not that Jacare doesn't have striking, but when we think of his world class abilities, it's the submission game. And you know he he cited some examples and, and 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 but but you know more so than really going through and breaking all the the, the examples. Um, I, I just started kind of conceptually thinking about that in in, in my mind, and it's just like well. I mean, it just kind of makes sense, right? Um, I mean, a guy that's that's striking that moves up in weight. Yes, you worry about how the power will transfer. Um, how, you know, will it follow him with him to the higher weight class? But then you also think about the speed that he brings. And at the end of the day, I mean, the technique that these that these guys and gals bring to the table. I mean, it's it's not just pure physical power. You know what I mean? It's actually. Um, it's technique, you know, and, and they're so good at that technique um, that, you know, grand enough, I mean, we're, we're talking extreme examples, you know, if a flyweight moved up to 170, okay, all right, now, you know, come on, now, now, now we're, we're being ridiculous, you know, uh, but it makes sense. So, you know, I think that the speed that that person brings to the table along with that te- technique allows that power to transfer a little bit, but when you talk about grappling, um, which again, technique has a lot to do in grappling. I mean, that's, that was kind of the art of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the art of Gracie jiu-jitsu, right, was allowing the smaller man to have these techniques to compete. But in a day and age when everybody is versed in those techniques, now, you know, the, the core strength and, and the that you have, it means something, you know. And so, um, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting theory. Again, I, I you know, it's not something that I've broken down and, Hey man, we took a sampling of a hundred fighters who were based in striking, and a hundred fighters who were based. You know, it's not that, but when you just kind of conceptually think about it, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th- that that seems to make some sense. Um, so you know, seeing Jacare struggle at 205 it makes you wonder about his future. I mean, it does to me. We actually left him in the 185 pound rankings in the MMA Junkie rankings. You know, talking to to Gorgeous George from the radio team. Um, you know, we, we have a little bit of flexibility. I mean, he moves one one time, he could easily move back. Um, I I don't know what the future is. I mean, Jacques Ray turns 40 in December. Uh, you know, is, is his home at 205? Is it is it 185? I'm not sure, but. Um, that was disappointing. But it, to me, it was also disappointing from Jan Blahovich because I just don't understand. I mean, I get it. you got to fight safe, man. you got to fight safe. I, I get it. Jacques Ray's dangerous. And you don't know what he's going to bring to the table, and there's some studying to do, and there's some mystery involved in the new weight class. But at some point, man, you got to make an adjustment. you got to change the strategy. you got to do something, especially, look, if you're just, you know, I've lost three fights in a row, and i got to win or I could get cut. Cool. Cool. Do that. But Jan Blahovich is out here talking about a title shot. If he's out here talking about a title shot, now we're already talking about Dominic Reyes in the mix at 205. Okay, he looks like he's next. It looks like that's going to happen in Houston against John Jones. Awesome. Cool. Corey Anderson believes he deserves a piece of the title. All right? Um, and, and he's got an argument. You know, he, he's got an argument for why he does. And I like the fact that he's chirping and he's staying busy because Corey Anderson's kind of a quiet, reserved guy. Um, the fact that he's doing it, I like it. you you, you got to do something to stay interesting. Cool. So he's probably number two. I mean, to me, Corey Anderson waits for for Dominic Reyes, John Jones. He's number two. 
But Jan Blachowicz is out here trying to get a title shot as well. And he's got, look, he's 6-1 and one his last seven. The only loss, Tiago Mejeta Santos, who went on to fight for the title. So to say that you're right there, it's not, it's, it's, it's not absurd. It's not absurd. But, dude, you got to do something that um, makes people want to see it. Makes people want to see it. And, and, and I just don't see how this made people want to see it. It just... So that was the, that's what was disappointing to me. That's what was disappointing to me is that I, I just... I, I would have liked to see... And I like Jan Blahovic a lot, man. I really do, man. He's a good dude. Um, and, and, man, he can be dangerous. On his best day, he can be dangerous. And he knows that the end is coming, but... That just did nothing in terms of trying to trying to sell me on on a, on a fight, man, on on a, on a title shot. Just yuck, 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 yuck. Not not a great main event. And the problem was not a great main event and five rounds at that, but followed by that weird split draw between Paul Craig and Mauricio Shogun Hua. And this fight puzzled me for so many reasons, man. It really did. It puzzled me because I don't understand what Paul Craig was doing, and I like Paul, man. I am such. Paul is such a, again, talking about good dudes and, you know, the, the Scottish accent, and he's always fun to talk to, man. He's such a, a, you know, cutting jokes and just always a good person to be around on fight week. But, you know, intense as well. He comes in with the Scottish war paint. And, um, man, you know, he's had some amazing, you know, moments in his career. I mean, the Magomed Ankalaya fight where he was just getting absolutely starched for three rounds and then gets the submission at the 4:59, you know, mark of round three. I mean, that's insane. I mean, that. Uh, so he's had some great moments. But I just don't understand what was going on in this fight, man. I really don't. Um, and and to be honest, I just feel like Paul Craig threw the fight away, man. I mean, Shogun is a, is a crafty veteran, and his best days physically are definitely behind him. But as far as mentally, um, his toughness, his durability, he's. I mean, sh- like Shogun's not giving up. He's not going away. Um, and he battled through this, but I really do feel like Paul Craig gave the fight away. Just poor, uh, I guess fight IQ is the right word, or at least just you know game management. I guess if you want to go that way, I just don't understand what the strategy was. So, and and then I don't understand the score. I get, I I I do totally. I get the twenty eight twenty eight score. I understand the draw. The round one as a ten eight does not appall me um but uh, i don't know man i I thought it was very clear that shogun won rounds two and three so the you know the at the very you know at the i guess it you know at the end of the day if everybody had it 28 28 it's still a draw so maybe it doesn't matter but i don't know just when i see scores where i'm like how do you how do you how did you judge that for that person in in terms of who won i (laughs) And the thing that really frustrates me about that, when 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 I feel like the scores like you just didn't correctly identify the round winner, is that when we had these discussions about you know how do we fix judging, and I see a lot of very educated, very smart people saying, man, you know what we need? We need half points. We need half points in a way. The judges need half points, man. That would be better. And you know when I look at fights where I'm saying, look, we didn't even correctly identify the round winner. And if we didn't correctly identify the round winner, how in the hell? Can we say that we want the judges now doing half points? If they can't even determine the right guy that won, how can they determine whether it's a 10 9 and a half or 10 9 or 10 8 and a half? That's why the I don't disagree with the concept of a half point system. I don't, but I just don't think we're there yet. If we're admitting that our judges are picking the wrong guys, why do we want another variable to make their job harder? I just I, I don't I, I don't get that argument. I never will get that argument. So I don't know. Just weird. So when you had those as your final two fights, and then here's the other thing. So so this is why I say I think people were being a little too hard on this card because as the prelims were going on, you know, even internally in our chat and made jungle, we're like, oh man, this you know, prelims are moving along, man, on ESPN Plus. There's no filler, they're not going to the desk, they're not doing any of that. Um, and, and, and there were some good fights. I mean, um, you know, started out with Tracy Cortez. Uh, Tracy Cortez had a really entertaining win over Vanessa Mill. I like Tracy Cortez a lot, man. She has an incredible backstory, man. Just this heart-wrenching story. She made it through the Contender Series. Um, and she's fun, man. She goes out there and bangs. 
She scares me a little bit because she seems to get hit a, a, a little too much. I think she's too willing to, to, to take a shot to give one. So that scares me a little bit. But, man, she went out there and, and, and was banging and, and having some fun. Um, second round was a little slow, kind of stalled in the clinch. But, anyway, I like Trace Cortez. There's some there's some excitement there. I liked uh, the Ariane Lipsky versus Isabella de Padua fight. Um, kind of some, uh, you know, Ariane Lipsky has the ability to be really good. She hasn't shown it in her UFC career. And she showed it here, but she also had some um, – some difficulties as well. So, I mean, I, to me, that fight was entertaining, man. It was it, There was tension. Even though the score was rather one-sided, uh, Isabella de Padua, man, she t- taking the fight on, what, like 30 hours notice or something. I mean, she came I thought she gave a, a great um, effort, man. I thought she really did, man. I thought she showed that, hey, let, yeah, listen, I came here on weird circumstances, but I deserve it. So, cool. So, I'm happy, man. First two fights, women's fight. Douglas Silva de Andrade uh, picks up the, the win over Henning Burrell. Tough man, I always knew this was man. Tuggle Silva to Andrade, he, he's he's man, he's a, just a little tank, man. Just an absolute little tank. And Henry Burrell, ah, uh, everybody's calling for his retirement, but you know he's he's out there fighting hard, and maybe he's gonna get cut by the UFC. But I mean, a, 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 you know, a decent fight nonetheless. Then Randy Brown comes out and really picks up the pace. Submission win over Warley Owls. I mean. Randy Brown by submission over Warley Owls. I mean, amazing. I, I told you guys going in, I thought this was going to be a good fight, man. I was really looking forward to this fight. Didn't think it was going to be Randy Brown by submission, but I thought it was going to be a banger. Francisco Trinaldo versus Bobby Green. Another one where Bobby Green, um, and, I, and, I, and I said it you know, on our internal Slack chat as the fight was going on, reminds me of the, uh, the pre-resurrection era Jorge Masvidal. Where Bobby Green is slipping and moving and rolling and not not you know not taking punches, but then just doesn't have the output back, and I think that's why he ends up costing himself rounds, man. And I think Masvidal used to have it a lot. You know, he's kind of the king of the split decision loss forever, um, until obviously now he's taking things to a whole nother level. But that's what it reminded me of with Bobby Green. Um, I think he's fun, man. I think he's fun to watch, and I think he's super talented, um, and he's slick. But, man, he, he gets in these things where, you know, I, I don't want to say it's like sparring or it's he's comfortable. He's slipping shots, and he's rolling with it, and he's moving, and he's not taking damage, but he's not doing enough to give it back. And I think that's why he ends up costing himself rounds. And, um, I mean, Francisco Trinado is a tough, tough dude, man. You can't afford uh, to give away rounds like that, man. And I, and I really did. I didn't like the 30-27 score for Francisco Trinaldo. Um, but I, 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 I saw it coming, man. I just, I, I felt, I was like, man, Bobby Green's falling into the shell and, uh, and cost him, man. And it sucks, man. I know he was frustrated. I know you could see it in his face and I, and I understand why. Um, but I, I don't think the scores were unjust to be honest with you. Uh, and I think if Bobby Green would just ramp up the output a little bit more, he'd probably, you know, take home these wins. So there was that. And then Ricardo Ramos comes in, gets a submission win over Eduardo Garagori. Ricardo Ramos looks like a real talent, man. He really does. And then James Krause, man, just absolutely schooled Sergio Marais and, and got the third-round finish. Big result for James Krause. Um, so, I mean, I thought the prelims were good, man. I honestly really did. And then you got the Wellington Tournament versus Marcus Perez, which was just not – Incredibly exciting. Uh, ditto for Andre Muniz versus Antonio Arroyo. I don't know what Antonio Arroyo was doing, man. I just, ah, uh, man, yeah. Both these fights were a little bit frustrating. So the the the, the, the you know the main card started off kind of grinding to a halt. Then you had Charles Oliveira come in and get the uh, the big finish over Jared Gord. Charles Oliveira, nine years in the UFC, and I feel like he's finally coming into his own. Not that he hasn't had great results uh, along the way, he has, uh, and this was just another one for him, but. I mean, starting to understand about calling people out. You know, he's always been this very quiet, humble, reserved, religious guy. Man, he comes out to, like, slow, religious praise music. I mean, there's no hard rock or rap or whatever to get him fired up. Um, but he's finally understanding that, you know, as respectful as he wants to be, man, you got to make some noise. And I thought, you know, he called out Conor McGregor. Okay, I mean – no disrespect to Charles Oliveira, but that's not going to happen. I mean, Conor McGregor's just on a different plane. I mean, not not in terms of ranking. I mean, in terms of ranking, you know, absolutely, man. Charles Oliveira deserves a top fight, but we know that, you know, Conor McGregor's about those star fights. We get that. So, um, not going to happen, but hey, man, at least it's something. It's a, it's a move in the right direction. And Charles Oliveira, man, I, I mean, the guy is firing on all cylinders. 
Um, and, I, and I, man, I've been a big fan of his forever. And like I say, still only 30 years old after nine years in the UFC. That's crazy. I mean, we've literally watched this kid grow up, man. I mean, we've seen him hit a growth spurt. You know, I always talk about when he first came in the UFC, I think he was like 5'10 at the time. Now he's like 6'1. And he grew while he was in the UFC. He was so young when he came in. So Charles Oliveira deserves uh, s- some big fights, you know. Uh, you know, I threw out the name Islam Makachev. I think that would be a good matchup. I know that Islam Makachev isn't, you know, the big star name, but that's a name that has some respect, at least within the community, and there's not a lot of people that want to fight Islam Makachev. So that could be, you know, a nice little feather in the cap, at least in terms of the way the UFC looks at him, you know, to take on a fight that nobody wants. And if he could win that, that would mean something. I heard people throw out the name Kevin Lee as well. Boy, I, I, I like that idea as well. And Kevin Lee, that is somebody that has a little swag behind the name, you know. And, of course, after his most recent outing, definitely so. So that could be a really fun fight, man. So I think Charles Oliveira is in line for a big fight. Um, you know, he did mention potentially Paul Felder, which would be good. It would make some sense. I mean, Paul Felder beat him back in December 2017. So, of course, understanding why he'd want a rematch. I do feel that Paul Felder is is holding out for kind of some of those bigger names. Um and just not a rematch. I think Paul Felder knows he's doesn't have a ton of time left fighting. Not that he has to be done, but it's just that you know he's he's turning into a, a fantastic commentator as well. And I, I don't think there's a you know I, I don't think he th- he thinks there's a you know just time for him to take fights that aren't directly a move up. You know, so um, we'll see, we'll see. But a big result for Charles Oliver. But then of course. We got we got to that co-main event, main event. So, just not a great great uh, way to finish the night in Brazil. But I mean, everybody's been just trash in this card. I did think the prelims were were better. It was just the main card was a uh, was a rough go. Fortunately, we were not planning on doing an and a half uh, for that card just because I thought the interest was a little bit low going in, and um, you know we were we we had some other stuff going on at the time, so. Uh, didn't 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 have to try to pull one together afterwards, which was a, a very would have been a tough night to do it because I was I was uh, <laughs> I think we were all ready to be done with MMA for the night that night. So um, listen, like I said, a rare non uh, UFC week this week. Still plenty of MMA action now. By the time you listen to this, uh, one championship will probably be uh, in the books. Um, that said, not missing a lot there. Um, this is. Um, it's a card over in Singapore. There's quite a few kickboxing fights on it. The main event's kickboxing, so a little bit more undercard driven. Uh, you do have uh, Kobe Northcutt, though. However, of course, the sister of Sage Northcutt. Man, uh, fingers crossed. You know, man. Uh, you know, obviously, she saw what happened to her brother last time out. Man, I, I, I mean, I can't imagine you can think about that. I mean, I, I gotta imagine you, you have to put that out of your head. But man, I mean, that's your, that's your your flesh and blood right there, you know, and you saw what happened. So hopefully nothing like that is in her mind uh, as she steps in there because it's it's certainly not healthy to have those types of thoughts. But, um, of course, Colby Northcutt, a name. Yes, uh, you know, uh, she's 0-1 in mixed martial arts, so it's not like we're saying she's going to run out and win a title. But, of course, her name is going to draw some interest. Uh, Cage Warriors is actually happening uh, Friday morning as well. That will be on USC Fight Pass. Double event week in London, England. So, was talking to some judges and some some referees this week. They're doing both. So they're doing Cage Warriors on Friday, and then Bellator on Saturday. Again, Bellator Europe six, um, which uh, a little bit easier this time because it's not like the crazy dual event where it's Bellator Europe six and Bellator two thirty seven or whatever. It's not that. Um, so my understanding is, as best I can tell, which I will say it's a little frustrating sometimes because now we got we got Paramount, we got the Zone, we got the Bellator app. I mean, look, these cards, the Bellator Europe cards, are designed for the European audience. There's no question about it. They're on terrestrial TV over there. So, um, you know, for the European fans, it's awesome. It's in prime time. It's on regular TV. Uh, it's easy. For, if you're a U.S. fan, it's a little bit harder to find. Um, but, hey, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. They Those poor Europeans have been watching UFC cards at like 4 in the morning their whole life. So uh, give, give them, give them, give them a, 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 you know, Throw them a bone every now and then. And, and there's a couple matches, a ton of fights on here. Um, but there's a couple fights definitely worth paying attention to. Of course, Michael Page, again, uh, MVP versus Gianni Melillo in the main event. Fabian Edwards, uh, the brother of Leon Edwards, the undefeated prospect there against Mike Shipman. That's a fight that has fireworks written all over it and it has been tried to pull together for quite some time. 
Uh, Terry Brazier, Soren Bach, highly respected prospect there. Uh, kind of rounds out your three fight main card. So some fights worth watching on Saturday. Uh, I will be traveling home on Saturday. I, I took this week off. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on vacation uh, outside of uh, – I mean, I'm still working, but I just took some time off from Junkie. Try to burn my vacation days before the the, uh, the year is over. Why waste those days, right? If your employer gives them to you, you might as well take them. But I am out here again, uh, UFC Fight Pass, CFFC 80, so hopefully you will tune into that. Uh, just to give you a, a, a couple quick highlights on it, things worth watching. As I said, the main event, a, a, a big fight veteran in Mike Biggie Rose. You know, he fought in the UFC three times, including uh, a, a decision against Robert Whitaker, who would then, of course, go on to win the middleweight title in the UFC. He also fought in Bellator once and <laughs> faced Rafael Lovato Jr. So uh, the man has faced the current Bellator middleweight champion and a former uh, UFC middleweight champion. Uh, he's now fighting a light heavyweight, actually. And I, I talked to him before the fight, and he's like, look, I know some people may think I'm just letting myself go. That's not the case. He was like, 170 was a ridiculous cut. I can't do that anymore. I was killing myself to get to 170. He said, 185 is where I'd like to be. Um, he said, I think that's the right place for me. He's like, but, you know, when you're, when you're kind of on this regional stage sometimes, uh, you know, you're, you're not getting eight weeks in advance or whatever. You know, you're getting a little bit shorter notice. And um, 205 uh, is a good place for me. Now, he's fighting a kid uh, from Fairfax, Virginia, in the gym, Wally. Um, man, he, uh, he's, he, he look, uh, you know, t- I saw him today for the first time in person. Uh, and he is more of a, a, a legitimate light heavyweight. And I say that Biggie Rhodes isn't a legitimate light heavyweight, but Najim is a, is a big dude. Uh, doesn't have the experience of Mike Rhodes. It certainly has not faced the type of, of fighter that he has, but is definitely dangerous. Has heavy hands. Uh, so that'll be your main event. The vacant light heavyweight title is on the line. Uh, the co-main event is a uh, 225-pound catchweight bout. William Knight is on the card. Remember William Knight, the nightmare, uh, got the UFC developmental deal uh, through Dana White's Contender Series. Has already had one fight. Now, they got the Contender Series uh, appearance in August um, and then uh, fought, I want to say, in October, I believe, for CES MMA. And now here he is in November uh, fighting his second fight on the developmental deal. Um, but he's fighting a guy uh, named Tafan Dadan uh, Chukwi. And uh, Tafan is um, man is is uh, is a two zero prospect as well, and uh, says he actually he's seen William Knight you know on his way up, um, has respect for him, understands, but is is not intimidated in the least, not not scared one bit. So could be fireworks there in that catchweight bout. Um, I think both guys could fight two hundred five, but again, kind of a late notice uh, addition to the card, and the developmental deal fighter William Knight. Um, is going to face another undefeated fighter. So that could be fireworks as well. I'm excited for that one. We were supposed to get uh, Jamie Pickett on this card. Jamie Pickett was a two-time contender series fighter. Uh, came up short in both of them, but um, you know, lost to a, a couple guys that ended up going on to um, the UFC. They basically, you know, they both ended up getting uh, contracts uh, off their wins over him. So uh, Charles Bird and then uh, Punahele Soriano. So. Uh, no, 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 no shame in that. Um, unfortunately, Jamie Pickett uh, got food poisoning this week um, before he showed up. I think he, he, before he got here, as he was on his way here, whatever, he started getting sick. So uh, before he even, you know, kind of got settled in here in Virginia, uh, he he was getting sick, and so unfortunately that that uh, that fight was waved off. Bummed for uh, Rafael Celestino. Rafael Celestino was going to be in his opponent. Came all the way from Brazil. Um, so, you know, a long flight not to get a fight. And then of course, uh, the side story there as well was Rafael Celestino, uh, has a military background as well. So it was going to be pretty cool for him, a Brazilian military veteran, uh, to get to fight on a U.S. military base in front of the troops. So that fight's not happening. That was, that was kind of a bummer, but, um, those top two fights are still going to be big. And then, uh, a, a kind of a fun one at heavyweight, a, a local Virginia versus Virginia rivalry, Chandler Cole, five and one, uh, Chandler Cole, not the guy that is going to strike you, uh, the first time you see him as, oh man, this guy's got greatness written all over him. You know, he's, he's admitted he could shed a few pounds along the way, but, uh, has five, uh, five finishes I think four in the first round, um, wrestled in college. I mean, he's got a, a background there. Uh, and uh, work, works at a maximum security prison. 
in addition to being a, a local football coach and a local wrestling coach, he was kind of a, a multi-sport athlete growing up. So uh, interesting there. And he's going against uh, Keith Bell, a, another Virginia fighter who has kind of been around the block a little bit. So uh, interesting there. We've got an Adam Waite fight as, as well. Julian DeCourcy, uh, who has fought four times for Invicta and is, is now making her CFFC debut against Katie Perez, who is making her professional debut uh, we talked to her today. She had a great attitude. She's like, I don't, I don't care what my opponent's done. She's like, she's the same size as me. <laughs> you know, that's all that matters. She's another girl that weighs what I weigh today. So that means we can get it on. So should be a fun fight. Like I said, it'll be myself, uh, CM Punk, and Jessica Penne will all be on the uh, on the mic together. And then uh, I believe the, the way we've got it set up, there's no backstage area this time. So Jessica Penne will be doing the in-stage interviews. So looking for that. And it's on USC Fight Pass again. Hopefully you can watch it live. If not, at least catch the replay. I think it's going to be a cool show uh, in the uh, in the hangar here uh, at uh, Joint Base Langley Uses, which is a cool facility, man. It's been a really long day today on top of all the complications that happened uh, both uh, with the road show and, and just with you know pulling everything together on a military base. Uh, we, we got to go out and, and look around today, which was awesome, man. They took us all around the base. Um, started out on the water i guess this is one of the like the only i think they said the only army uh military installation that has uh like a maritime factor to it as well you know they had a bunch of boats and stuff so they took us out there and you know walked us through some of these boats which were cool um man living on a boat good lord it crammed up in there <laughs> you know they were talking about the living facilities whoo tough man but we got to do a little bit of that and then uh and then we walked around and and they took us through different uh like these training simulators for these apache helicopters man which these i mean they're just uh the apache helicopters i guess if you know anything about warfare or or, or military equipment i mean these damn things uh they look they <laughs> they look like an absolute game changer in terms of uh i guess they were saying basically now like u.s troop movement anywhere you know doesn't happen without these these Apache helicopters, you know, joining forces and, and providing them aerial support and just the, the weaponry that's on them, including the – and I'm sure people have probably seen this before, but I didn't know. Like, you know, they have the, the thing where the gun is attached uh, – not not physically attached, but it's linked uh, to, the, to the gunner's helmet. So wherever he's looking, you know, the gun follows that. But then they were saying – and I, I had heard of that before, but then – I guess they were saying there's even optical sensors on top of that. So it's not just the head movement. You know, it's even within that range of the head. It's the optical movement as well. Um, so that it, it, like, wherever you're looking, it tracks exactly. And then you, you know, you pull the trigger and and it's it's firing right where you're looking at. So, I mean, you talk about, I mean, you're basically using that as your, um, you know, your, your, your targeting system. I mean, that's insane. And then, you know, they're talking about the technology of how, like, even um, – you know the, the the helicopters you know if they get a, a good position can uh you know they've got the technology where like you know their overhead panel or whatever is displayed down to the ground so the troops down there can can see exactly what the the helicopter pilot is seeing in terms of okay here's here's you know where the forces are over there here's all, i mean just i don't know man just cool shit you know i mean not, not that not that uh that that military and war is necessarily always a, a fun topic man i mean you're, you're talking about things that involve loss of life but um pretty pretty insane to to see what uh, our military is capable of and what these guys and gals are out there training to do and it's cool man they showed us around the whole base and and uh treated us like vips man it was so cool like the, i mean the 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 the, the, the mma fans in the in the military community is so cool i mean for these uh, military people to come up and have any idea who I am. I mean, to just say hello and they're fans of my work or whatever. I mean, that's good Lord, man. That's just an awesome feeling, man. To For all the bullshit, to be honest, <laughs> that we see sometimes online with people talking shit and trolling and whatever else, man, to have people that are out there doing what these people are doing, come up and say, man, they, they, you know, they're big MMA fans and they, they appreciate your work and stuff, man. It's, it's pretty damn cool. So I am excited about this show, man. I really am. I know everybody, uh, and the entire promotion is excited for it. So, anyway, uh, listen, non-USC weekend, so I won't try to keep you too long. Uh, I'm sure everybody probably appreciates a nice little break. Next week uh, will be Thanksgiving, but you, come on, man. You know we still coming with the MMA Roadshow. We don't take a week off. So, we'll still have some fresh content next week, um, even though it will be another non-USC week. So, uh, you know, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of stuff going on, but uh, – 
uh, we'll, we'll kind of enjoy the holidays and bounce around a little bit. And then uh, for us, of course, it'll get uh, – uh, I, I will not be out in Washington, D.C., just kind of looking ahead to the schedule. I think the, the young Mike Bond is handling that one out there in D.C. But then, of course, USC 245 will be big in Vegas. So, anyway, uh, that's all coming. We'll, we'll we'll figure that all out in the future. In the meantime, just uh, tune into USC Fight Pass, all right? And uh, whether you do or not, I sure hope you will. But uh, either way, thanks for listening. <laughs>